OK, let's take a look at the homework. Page 15. Number one, our teacher can speak five languages. Number two, oh, this table is heavy. Jim, I would say can. Can you help me move it? You can say can or could or will or would. You cannot say may. May means allow, ring shu. But you can use the other options. Number three. We come to class on weekdays. We do not have to come to class on weekends. Number four, park here. It's free. You. OK, so the fastest way is you need not. Or you can say you don't have to pay anything or one last answer you uh, have or or need to pay nothing so really these three answers are three different ways to negate the sentence one you can negate the obligation Two, you can negate the action. Three, you can negate the money. You have three options. Number five, when you speak in court, you must tell the truth. You must not tell lies. That part is correct. Number six, Pat looks tired. She should get some rest. Number seven, I wanted tickets for the concert, but they were all sold out. I should. OK, this is not a modal question. This is actually a contra, uh, contrafactual question. Otherwise known as subjunctive. This is a question. So it's a bit Should have ordered. We will talk about this uh, in the second half of the semester. Number eight, the children are supposed to be in bed by nine o'clock. Number nine, the Garcias. This is a Spanish name, Garcia. The Garcias. Uh, so the Garcia family are supposed to be here at seven. So we said that American English takes a group as singular, like family is one family, class is one class. But here they already are two people or more than two people, the Garcias. It already makes it plural. So you have to use R. Also, they, right? It says here, they will be late. So it's plural. 10, we're going to make chicken for dinner. Why don't you join us? In Chinese, we say, This is the only answer. If you say why, won't you join us? This means that the person has already said no, and you're asking them why not. So the only answer is don't. Yeah. 
11. Here's my advice about your diet, Mr. Jackson. You should or ought not eat a lot of sugar and salt. Uh, OK, actually, this should be sugar or salt. Uh, the reason is because in English, when you negate uh, more than one thing, if you only add no or not, you negate the combination. 如果你在英文里面你要同时否定很多东西，如果你只是单纯加一个no或者是not的话，你所否定的是and这个集合。so you're saying you cannot have sugar and salt, but you can have sugar or you can have salt. But in this case, I think the doctor is telling Mr. Jackson neither sugar nor salt. Uh, so the fastest way to do this is to use or. If you negate with or, that means neither one singular and also not the combination. 如果你否定的时候，把and改成or，代表说个别不行，两个加起来也不行。And uh, in this case, the word diet does not mean uh, Mr. Jackson wants to lose weight. Diet just means the food that you eat. Twelve. This is wonderful music. Uh, music. Will we dance? OK, this should be shall. Shall we dance? This uh, we no longer use the word shall in everyday circumstances, but in this case. A is inviting B to dance. This is a formal use of language uh, So for an invitation, usually we use shall. Continuing, shall we dance? No, let's not dance. It says let's don't dance. Uh, in fact, the answer is already in the second half. It says let's just sit here and talk. Look at these verbs. These are all Simple, present, plural. Same thing. So even though this is negation, it should still be the same. It should still be simple, present, plural. So let's not dance. OK, do you have questions about these 12? OK, moving on. Page 16. Dear Indira, Indira is an Indian name for a woman. Sorry it's taken me so long to email. I should have gotten to this. To get to something means to do something. Weeks ago, but I've been so busy. I'm really looking forward to seeing all you guys again. This is OK. Technically, it should be all of you guys, but often uh, the of will be omitted. of. So all you guys is correct. School is tough, but really interesting, and I'm sure I should be studying even more than I have been. Part of the problem is that I'm taking too many classes. You're only supposed, supposed to take five a term, but I'm taking six. All right, so the first one, supposed to. You can say five a term, you can say five per term. May Shui woman. Anyway, I've gotten to know a lot of new people, which means uh, I have met a lot of new people. I have this one really good friend. OK, so the word this here just means, for example. I have this one really good friend, a girl named Jane. She invited me to her house last week for a party. Actually, it was my birthday, but I didn't know she knew that. 
Technically, there should be that here. Know that she knew that. Uh, we will talk about this, I think, next semester. Um, but when you have a complete sentence, she knew that subject, verb, object. Used as part of a bigger sentence, it should have the word that before it in front of it. Um, but in colloquial cases, informal cases, but you can omit the that. So technically, uh, we can let it go. I figured, figure means guess. I figured I better take some kind of gift. Okay, so it should be I had better. Again, if you're talking to somebody, it's okay to skip this had, uh, but you should know that it should be there. Some kind of gift, but I couldn't decide what it should be. Finally, I came up with the idea of a bouquet of flowers, hua shu, bouquet. It's pronounced bouquet because it's French. As soon as I got to the party, I gave it to Jane. But then the funniest thing happened. Are there any mistakes in this? <laughs> the funniest thing happened. I guess I ought to have expected something was up. Something is up means something strange was going on. From the mysterious way Jane was acting, but I didn't. This was a surprise party for me. As soon as I sat down, a lot of people jumped up from places where they'd been hiding. This is correct. And shouted, surprise, happy birthday. I was embarrassed, but I must not have been because. Hmm. So something is wrong here. I was embarrassed, but I must not have been. So I was embarrassed but I was not embarrassed. Something needs to change. Because everyone was really friendly. OK, so this means that she did not look embarrassed. So how, do, how can we change this? I must not have uh, seemed or looked and um, it or so. I must not have seemed it. I must not have looked it. I must not have seemed so. I must not have looked so. In this case, so is a kind of pronoun. It means like this. So I was embarrassed, but I, it did not look like I was embarrassed because everyone was really friendly, and pretty soon I forgot about my embarrassment. Then they gave me presents. I was about to put them away, so she died. But Jane said, aren't you going to open them? I didn't know what to do. In Singapore, you shouldn't open. You shouldn't open gifts right when you get them. So in this case, this is a rule. It's a general rule. Um, so there's no question of time. Use the simplest form. But apparently you are supposed to in Australia. OK, so she's in Australia. So I opened them. The nicest gift was a new blouse from Jane. A blouse is like a top, like a shirt, sangyi. She told me I must. OK, I had to. Go and try it on immediately, so I did. The answer is also part of the sentence. The second half of the sentence uses try. Simple present. So this must also be simple present, right? A and B, both verbs must use 
the same tense and aspect. So I must go and try. But in this case, it is the past tense. Must does not have a past tense, so you have to change the word. So we use have past tense of have had to go and try it on immediately. So I did. It's beautiful. Nope. Past tense. It was beautiful. Yes, the blouse probably still is beautiful, but Indira is telling a story. The story happens in the past, so the time should always be in the past unless Indira specifically jumps outside of the story to say something. For example, when she said in Singapore, you shouldn't open. She's jumping outside of the story. Uh, so this sentence should not be in the past. Um, but here she's describing her reaction to the blouse at the time. Her first reaction, so it should be in the past. Anyway, what a party. This is good. What a party is a good thing. I thought I knew all about Australian culture, but the custom of opening up presents in front of the gift giver was a strange one. Same reason. She's still telling a story. Uh, and I guess we can assume that now it is not as strange. The weather is kind of chilly. How is it back in Singapore? Nice and warm? I, you can say shall, but more common is I will bring you something special from Australia. Oh, I, I see what, okay, it's a question. Aha, so shall I, because it's a question. Remember, uh, we just saw the sentence, shall we dance? So here, shall I bring? You something special from Australia when I come. Well, Indira, I got to sign off now right soon. Love, Tong Li. Right, sorry, letter from Tong Li to Indira. Sign off just means to uh, log off, then Chu. Here it means to end the letter. Okay, do you have questions about page 16? Moving on, page 17, another editing. Why we itch? Why do we itch? You might think that, okay, so here when it says might, it's very weak because this idea will immediately be knocked down. So here it, it's deliberately very weak. You might think that scientists have found the answer to this very simple question. Unfortunately, scientists can't answer this question with any certainty. So no certain answer. They simply don't know for sure. There are some clear cases involving itching. If a patient, Bing Huan, goes to her doctor and complains of terrible itching, the doctor, okay, terrible just means very serious, serious itching. The doctor will look for some kind of rash. A rash is when your skin becomes red and irritated. If he, uh, I should say. If he finds a rash, <laughs> he, of course, not every doctor is a man. If he finds a rash, the doctor, okay, this should be, uh would would probably say because it says if this has not happened it's what if it happens so the probability should be less the doctor would probably say that okay so the patient is a woman right her doctor she should eat something. Again, because must is present tense, uh, we need something in the past. 
uh, so we use should, which is the past tense of shall. You can also say, uh, no, 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 this is the only answer. Should, should eat something. She was, sorry, what's going on? She was allergic to, 对她过敏. Okay, so this is should not, should not have eaten. Should not eat. The past is should not have eaten. That's a terrible way to explain this. Should not eat, but here, after eating it, this problem starts happening. So there is a connection between these two parts of the sentence. And we use the perfect aspect, have eaten, to express this relationship. She should not have eaten something she was allergic to. OK, so it's negation. This is why we cannot use must. If you say must not have eaten, this is not obligation. This is not duty. This is probability. If you say must not have done something, that means it is very likely that you did not do this. That is not what this sentence wants to say. It wants to say you should not have done this. It was a bad idea to do this. You did it and it's a bad idea. So must is not the wrong answer. It has to be should. Should not have eaten. Uh, something she was allergic to. Or that an insect. Must have stung or bitten her eating bait was a baiting. Scientists can easily explain this kind of case. Most itching, however, does not have an obvious cause. Here's what scientists do know. Right under the surface of the skin, there are sensory receptors. This word looks like recept, uh, sorry, receipt, soju. Uh, you get a receipt when you receive the object that you buy. So it's a GSO chi receptor. These receptors detect pain and let the brain know about it. If there's a lot of stimulation to the body, the sensory receptors might carry a message of pain. Uh, okay, I think this should be may. May carry. Or I guess you could say might carry. Uh, both will do, may or might carry. A message of pain to the brain. If there isn't much stimulation, the sensors, again, might or may report it as itchiness, fa yang. There's been a lot of speculation, yi ce, about the function of itching, ta de some researchers think the function of itching may be to warn. OK, so later today we will talk about this use of to plus verb. Maybe to warn the body uh, that it is about to have a painful experience. Others theorize that early humans might have developed itching as a way of knowing they needed to take insects out of their hair. Ooh. OK, so this should be have developed because this idea is connected to the next idea. Um, and we use perfect tense to show this relationship. Once, so the idea is if we don't have itching, we don't know that there are insects in our hair. Once we do have itching, we can know that there are insects there and we can take them out. So after developing itching, then we can do this. So this should be in perfect tense. Still others believe that itching could be a symptom uh, of serious diseases such as diabetes and Hodgkin's disease. I don't know what Hodgkin's disease is. 
one of the most interesting aspects of itching is that it may have, sorry, it may be less tolerable than pain. Uh, there's nothing special going on here, so we just simply use the uh, simple present tense. May be less tolerable. Nai rongren. Research has shown, in fact, that most of us tolerate pain better than itching. So a quick note, you tolerate something better or worse. Many people are willing to injure their skin just so they can get rid of an itch. So people are willing to hurt themselves to stop itching. This is correct. Uh, the grammar is correct. OK, do you have questions about page 17? Moving on, page 18. Find and correct five mistakes. Cool. A. Hi, Jack. I'm glad you finally made it to the party. But where's Gina? This name is Gina. Do you think she might have forgotten about the party? Or, okay, this should be, could she have had to work late? And the answer is also in the sentence. Or, so before this and after this should use the same tense and aspect. So before it says might have forgotten. So after it should be, have had to work. Uh, so A, this person is guessing. Maybe A, uh, maybe this, maybe that. B, I think Gina must be sick. She didn't look good earlier today. A, that's too bad. What about Al and Lisa? B. Al told me that he couldn't get here by seven, but he should be able to make it by eight. Or you can uh, omit this part. You can say uh, should make it. So probability, hopefully, the, he, it is likely that he will make it. I don't know about Lisa. I suppose she could be working late. So they are asking why is Lisa not here? So if she is here, not here because of work, she is still working. She is in the middle of working. So she could be working late. But she didn't say anything to me about it. A. I guess she might be on her way here right now. I hope so. Here, right now, right? Present tense. So might be. Is that five? One, two, three. Oh, it's five. Great. So uh, do you have questions about this one? OK, find and correct another five mistakes. A, did you see the email? All employees are to attend. This just means have to attend. Uh, and again, we will talk about this next week. Our, uh, this week, this week, later today are to attend the goodbye party for our CEO, Brent Chang. B, yes, I did see it. His wife was invited too, but she must decline because she is going on a trip. OK, no, this is incorrect. It's a logic question. How do they know that the CEO's wife 
cannot come because she's going on a trip. Are they so familiar with the CEO's wife? No, right? It's because she has already replied to the email. So this is in the past tense. She had to decline. Again, must does not have a past tense, so we have to change this to have. Had to decline because she, and then this is correct because this will be in the future. She will be going on. She is going on a trip. So this part is correct. Uh, so I keep saying, right, grammar decides your situation, your context. This is one good example. The sentence itself is correct, but the logic of the situation does not make sense. A, since it's a good buy party, we should not forget to buy him a present. If you say don't have to, that means you do not have a duty to. But here you, you, it means you have a duty not to. OK, let me let me break that down for you. Uh, don't have to means. Uh, no duty. Shouldn't means. Duty not to. For the Yang. So shouldn't forget to buy him a present. We had better this this is had better get. Get him something nice. We ought to. Buy him something useful too. B, I agree. Okay, do you have questions about this one? All right, page 19. Oh, I remember this one. This one is pretty fun. To all employees from Christie, subject paper clips, Hui Wenzhen. It has come to my attention uh, that some employees are bending paper clips nearly every day. So this email is about emplo employees who spend too much time playing with paper clips. A few copy clerks, uh, Cao Xieren, even bent, bend, bent, bent, even bent an entire box. Because of my duty as your supervisor, Jingli, I would remind you, this should be should, I should remind you, because she says duty, right? So this should be should should remind you that paper clips are expensive. Haha. Ha. In my 10 years of superior wisdom as your boss, I always okay, I have always given you a fair deal. I have always given you a fair deal. Because uh, she mentioned 10 years, right? Do I need proof before firing you? No, I'm pretty sure she does need proof, but anyway. Do I need proof before firing you? No, however, I think you are responsible employees. Therefore, hmm, does this make sense? 
Because later she says, therefore I will begin inspecting the desk. 开始检查每个人的办公桌。So I think she's saying that you are irresponsible employees. 不负责任的。Therefore, I will begin inspecting the desks in this office this morning. By quitting time, 下班时间 I will have checked every single one. If your desk contains a bent paper clip, you will. Find yourself out of a job. You 就没工作了 You know this would be a great time to mess with your colleagues. 这个整同事的好机会 Yeah, if you you have an enemy, right? You take a paper clip, you bend it, and you hide it in their desk. Oh, that's it. Okay, so do you have questions about page nineteen? Okay, great. So let's move on to this week's lesson. This week we are talking about gerunds, infinitives, and imperative mood. What are these things? Let's go one by one. First one is gerund. So, we have a typical sentence. I play the guitar. If you need to use this verb as the subject or the object, so if you need to change this verb into a noun, and there is no better option, like some verbs have nouns that simply mean the action, but if you have no better options, then you can use the gerund. In Chinese, we call this 动名词 and in fact, the Chinese name is makes much more sense. 动名词，动词当名词用，动名词。The gerund is not a regular noun because you cannot. There are some things that you cannot do to a gerund. You cannot use a plural. You cannot.、Um, Technically, you cannot make it singular. A、uh, playing.、Um, there's another kind of verb that looks like a gerund that you can count. It's called an action noun.、Uh, but technically, you cannot make gerunds countable. What you can do is you can bring along the object of the sentence, and you can bring along the subject of the sentence, but the subject will change. So, for example, this is bringing along the object. So, subject she verb likes, object playing the guitar. This action is one gerund phrase. Playing is the gerund. And its original object, the guitar, comes along for the ride. So you can say, if you want to, you can say she likes playing, but then the question is, what kind of playing? Does does this mean she likes having fun? Does it mean she likes playing a musical instrument? Does it mean that she likes being an actress? We don't know. So sometimes you do have to bring the object along. So that the sentence makes sense. She likes playing the guitar. Now, when I bring along the subject, I have to change things because every sentence should only have one subject cluster. 
if the subject of the sentence is she, I can't say she likes I. So here's what I have to do. I have to change the original subject to uh, possessive, soil go. So in this case, this was the original sentence. I play the guitar. You turn the main verb into a gerund. You bring along the object if you have to, or it, it gives uh, important information. And you, if you need to say the original subject, you change the original subject into possessive. So these are gerunds. Again, some verbs have nouns that are better choices. So OK, so for example, the word invite. Uh, she in invited me to the party. I can use a gerund. Her inviting me to the party was a nice surprise. So again, in this case, the original verb gets turned into a gerund. The rest of the sentence is brought along for the ride because this is important information and the original subject is turned into a possessive. And in this bigger sentence, the main verb is be, was, and then a nice surprise finishes the sentence. But there is a simpler way to turn invited to a noun. In this case, the word invite itself can be a noun. As a verb, we say invite. As a noun, we say invite. Uh, so instead of saying inviting me to the party, you can simply say party invite. Or if you are old fashioned, you can say invitation. Now you might think, wait, what happened to the me? Aren't we losing this important invitation uh, in, in information? And the answer is no, it's in the context. Why else would I say this if I did not get an invitation from her? This is the only reason I would say this. Well, I mean, there are other reasons. You could say, oh, she invited my best friend. That was nice. But usually the person being invited should be clear. That's why somebody is saying this sentence. OK, those are gerunds. Question? So use gerunds if you have no better option. Next thing. Infinitives. Uh, in Chinese, we call this 不定词, which is also a better name than the English. You use an infinitive in two places. One, the easiest one to remember, is any verb after the word to uses the original form. Any verb after the word to uses the original form. Mm. So here it is not am, it is not is, it is be, the original form. Now, these are easy to remember because you already know have to and need to. 
but the underlying logic of the infinitive is something that is supposed to happen or expected to happen. Like notice even when I'm talking about this, I'm using the infinitive, right? Supposed to happen, expected to happen. This is different from the future tense. Uh, we said that the future is unpredictable, so it's always some kind of guess. It's true, but uh, when you use the future tense, the probability is already very high. If it is supposed to happen or it's expected to happen, but you're not sure whether it will or not happen, you will use the infinitive. So actually, we saw some examples today in the homework. In a cooking recipe, it might say you are to add two teaspoons of sugar. So this is very similar to saying you should add. But if you use the infinitive, it, it, it sounds less like an obligation or a duty, and it sounds more like something you are going to do if you follow the recipe. Um, he is to have finished the report by Friday. Again, you we expect him to finish it by Friday. We're not ordering him. We're not reminding him. This is simply saying this is the expectation. It's not and it the, the expectation part is the key. If I'm simply describing his schedule, I would use the future tense. He will finish. But I am expecting him to finish writing the report at that time. So it's an infinitive perfect. It's perfect because you know there's a reason I'm saying this. It's important to have that report. So whether he finishes it by Friday will influence what happens next. Therefore, it is perfect aspect. Now, uh, did I say two? Sorry, there are three places you might use an infinitive. The third place is, uh, I'm sorry, this will be very confusing, as a kind of gerund. Both of the sentences are correct, and they mean basically the same thing, but there is a small difference. A gerund is simply describing an action. It is an action, except you need it as, as a noun. That's all that is. It's everything that a verb is, except that it's a noun. It's used as a noun. But if you say to play, this creates a sense of expectation. It's when you think of this sentence, you're not thinking of somebody who is actually playing the guitar. You're thinking of a person in a situation where they might start playing, where they're thinking about whether to play. Uh, and in fact, this third use of the infinitive is very common. Let me show you why.
it's likely to happen means we expect it to happen. This is also infinitive. Something for me to do means someone is expecting me to do something. This is also infinitive. So it's, it should be very familiar to you. Uh, we talked about supposed to, have to. These are all using this uh, expectation, uncertainty of the infinitive. And that's why I like the Chinese name, 不定词. It's not certain. We only expect it to happen. Questions? Yes. Gerund. Ah, so you're actually talking about infinitive. Yes, so in order to, this falls under the first use case because it's always uh, original form. So anytime a verb appears after to, it's always in the original form. Good, other questions? Yes. Do you mean T-O-O? No, like um, I look for uh, Ah, so OK, so in the, we, you're right. Like uh, we were, were non-native speaker, we only recognize that, OK, two. So most of the students were going to say that, OK, two should be the uh, verb. OK, so thank you. In this case, meeting you is a gerund phrase. This is a domain to. So actually, after two, you're not adding a verb, you're adding a noun. This is why it's meeting and not meet. This entire action is one noun. OK. OK, thank you. Other questions? OK, let's take a short break. When we come back, we will have a presentation from groups two and three, and then we will talk about uh, imperative mood. 第七组来找我一下。哦，还有第一组，你们都没有填互评表，每一个组员都要填。
Um, hello, everyone. Uh, we are group two, and I'm Charlotte. And this is our. This is the title of the article: "Dying Order Our Di Our Dying Dying Order Then Gibberish and Silence." And now is the first part of this article. And the first part is talk about uh, death will be mentioned many times in this article. And expect for our and the most important things in this part is that uh, expect for our self consciousness and other gifts. We aren't immortals. So human usually make ourselves busy to ease the anxiety of leaving nothing before death which means that maybe after you die and no nobody will remember you and and one and the author want to say the one special way is is through grammar to ease this kind of anxiety and we we all agree about death which the article said what easily horrify us is we leave nothing, so we make ourselves busy to make sure we leave something for people to remember us. And the second part of this article starting to explain why grammar alleviates our anxiety about death. Firstly, humans are well-organized beings. Whenever we are shown that we can correctly handle grammars, makes us feel intact and healthy. And we all agree about the writer said that humans are well-organized beings because grammar has its own rules. When we can correctly control it, it makes, our, it makes us feel being in order. And the third part, is secondly for humans who put words in writing languages and words are tangible extensions of themselves and have self life than we do, which means they consider grammar and words can last longer than us. And also we agree about that language and words can can last longer than us. So and also uh, and tangible extensions that could actually last longer than us. And the last one is at the end of this article, the author said with grammar's help, we are sure to go on living through the words of other when such words describe or celebrates us in the future. That's it. Oh, thank you for listening. OK, thank you, group two. Uh, so as they said, this chapter is about grammar and death. Uh, and the author says that uh, because we can control language and language will live longer than us. So when we use correct grammar, it makes us feel like we have some kind of control over what happens after we die. The point is that it makes us feel more in control. Does it actually give us more control? Depends on what you write. If your name is William Shakespeare, then yes, it gives you more control after your death. But if your name is like John Smith, maybe not. OK, so now let's welcome group three to give their presentation. Hi, we're group three, and our topic is no effort without error. Uh, 
Before we begin in our presentation, please let me introduce my uh, our group member. Uh, where there are Ivy, Iris, Brian, Eva, Jenny, Emily, Summer, Katie, Albert, and I'm Cynthia. So um, as uh, as I mentioned before, our topic is no effort without arrow. Uh, first of all, we want to we want to introduce how we can face to how to face mistake. Uh, so sometimes in class, we we're too afraid to speak English. So um, only a few people will raise their hands to ask questions in class. So, um, but however, getting it, getting it wrong is part of getting right and also um, must it create progress for us. And um, when you're writing, if you ever want to uh, give up something upon, uh, on something, you can use an X to mark the first star. Stars, uh, you'll be discarded. And every time you mark an X on page, uh, it shows you're doing a good job for yourself. And we will continue to ex explain how to apply this in our work. The point I'm focusing on is what Charles Handy called getting is wrong is part of getting is right. In Chinese, we can call it 失敗是成功之母. So it fits the title of the article, No Effort Without Error. Yeah, and we all heard of Thomas Edison, who succeeded by trial and error. 试错, 尝试错误. So the sentence is on page nine, the last paragraph. The double willingness to take wise risks and learn to stand corrected seems to be the key to achieving traction toward any daunting goal we have. So we keep trying, we keep making mistakes, we keep finding progress in our mistakes, and eventually we succeed. So. Don't be afraid to make mistakes because it may bring you one step closer to success. And this page is talking about how to face mistakes. Uh, in this article, it mentioned four ways to teach us how to make, uh, how to face mistakes. The first way is try seeing all false starts for what they are, indispensable events in a life that gets anywhere. That means after we made a mistake, we should find out the problem or the root of these mistakes and fix it. And the second way is we don't need to fear getting it wrong, just aim for honesty, clarity, and impact. The third step is as soon as you have come to see the need to cut or change some words, Post to give yourself a heartfelt cheer. It means every time we found some mistakes, we don't need to be upset. Instead, we should encourage ourselves and face them. The last but not least, even though we got those or false again and again, we must keep one thing in our mind. That is, we cannot give up anything forever. 
Thanks, Eva, for sharing. Uh, after listening to our brief introduction to how to face mistakes, maybe you would, uh, you may wonder why should we face it? Uh, is it important or um, it can can it bring anything to us? Um, as the saying goes, um, learn from arrows, uh, grow from values, failures. And um, it's because, uh, oh, just like the, the article mentioned, uh, the author use nice girls this division to note what he should do or the place he ought to modify to find the correct uh, words uh, to find the correct words and why I agree this point is because and uh, it's because it will make uh, myself become better and also this is Mm, similar to my uh, teacher taught us in writing class. Uh, he said we should write first draft, second draft to modify many times to write the better writings. And that's why I think, uh, that's why I agree with this point. And um, Emily has a similar point of view to this point. Uh, later, she will going to uh, she will share her opinion on this point. Um, I agree with the last paragraph or the of the article where he says that the credit belong to the person who is actually in the arena because he felt bravely made mistakes appeared again and again and there was no effort without mistake and shortcomings because he struggles again and again he can grow from mistake and learn many new things. It's all because he is brave enough to try. So he will also have more gains. As the saying goes, Fletcher is the mother of success. Don't give up easily when first tried and don't get discouraged. After expressing a few failures, you will be less afraid and you will be able to learn from this failure and move towards success step by step. And this is our conclusion. Life has ups and downs. Mistakes are parts of it. Be honest, clear, and keep trying. When you need to fix things, be happy for your efforts. Even if you get lost, don't quit. Keep going. Every setback help you move forward on your journey. Like our theme, no effort without error. Just try your best and keep going. Thanks for listening. OK, thank you, group three. I think their presentation was very clear about the main idea. If you don't make mistakes, you're not trying and you will not improve. So in fact, mistakes are a good thing. 
Uh, and they bring up two very interesting examples. One example is about writing. One group member talked about how their writing teacher also told them just write again and again. Uh, in fact, this is why uh, in this class, our homework is all about correcting mistakes. I designed this course because I myself teach writing three, uh, which most of you will be taking next year. And the hardest thing for writing students to do is to correct their own mistakes. Most people do not notice their own mistakes until somebody points them out, somebody like the teacher. Hopefully, by giving you a stronger sense of correct grammar and the ability to notice grammar mistakes, it will be easier for you to find your own mistakes and improve your writing before the teacher uh, comes to help you. The other interesting example that group three gave is speaking. Uh, and this is interesting because I think uh, most of you are probably scared of public speaking, right? If I call a random name and say, can you please introduce yourself? You'll probably want to run away and cry. The reason people are scared of public speaking is because they are afraid of making mistakes. They're afraid that People will think if I make a mistake, they will think I'm stupid or I'm unprepared. They will think bad things about me. But in fact, everybody is listening to what you want to say. Nobody is listening to catch your mistakes. In fact, if you make a mistake and you keep going and you pretend like nothing is wrong, most people will not notice. So the key for me, the key to uh, confidence in public speaking is to remember that you, the speaker, have the power. You are the person sharing information, sharing a story. Everybody else is just here to listen and learn from you. They are not here to try to catch your mistakes. Uh, and this is also why the more public speaking that you do, the more confident you will get. Because every time you speak in public and nobody corrects you, that's one more proof that nobody is trying to catch your mistakes. So for example, when today I'm here teaching this class, I have not prepared a speech. As you know, I have not seen these questions that we go over, but I'm still able to share with you my information, my knowledge about grammar. So hopefully that will help you in the future. As I'm sure you know, as a student in DAE, you will be giving lots of oral reports. Uh, so hopefully this advice will help you in the future. OK, so uh, thank you again to groups two and three. Please remember to fill out the. Peer review sheets uh, while you still remember what everyone did. Every group member should fill one out and submit. Uh, so group one. You guys also have to submit these things. Uh, and please try to do this. Uh, earlier rather than later. Because I have to spend time calculating the score. Yeah. Uh, OK, let's continue with this week's lesson. We have talked about gerunds. We have talked about infinitives. Now let's talk about the imperative mood. The imperative mood, imperative in daily English means very important. The root of this word, uh, impera, this might remind you of imperial. Imperial is the adjective for empire. Uh, 
uh, and of course, empire it comes from the word emperor, Di Wang, or the Huang Di. And the idea is when the emperor tells you to do something, you have to do it. The imperative mood is used for giving orders as a qi si ju. And this is where the English name is better than the Chinese name. Uh, in Chinese, qi si, right? Qi chou ni lai zuo yi jian si qing is not strong enough. Imperative is a direct order. Someone is not asking you, someone is not inviting you, this person is ordering you to do something. Now, the word mood in grammar, there are three or four main moods. We have the uh, basic sentence, which is called an indicative mood. You're indicating something. That's the true jian si You have the imperative mood. You have the interrogative mood. You are interrogating someone. I suddenly can't remember the Chinese for interrogate. Was it zixing? No, 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 like when a, a policeman to a, a suspect. Yeah, yeah, something like that. So you're asking questions. Interrogative mood is just questions. Uh, and then some people think that there is a, a vocative or expletive mood when you are simply declaring your feelings like, oh, what a what a party. You're not actually giving information. You're expressing your feelings. Anyway, so there are three or four main moods. Imperative is when you're giving an order. How do you use the imperative mood? Uh, originally, you would say you should open the window. Right? This is indicative mood. But if you want to order someone to open the window, First of all, it's an order, so you don't have the should. Right? You don't have to say uh, this is your duty. You don't have to say we expect you to. You just tell the person. Secondly, when you use an imperative mood sentence, you are already talking to somebody, so you don't have to say you. You are already talking to this person. The rest of the sentence is the imperative mood. Open the window. It's an order. That's it. No subject. The verb is the original form, and the rest of the sentence is the same. So, for example, This is describing my feelings about this person. I want him to be happy. But if I order him to be happy, I would simply say, be happy. Uh, you would not often say this. Yeah, don't worry, be happy. Or like, be happy. Usually you would explain why. Be happy that you did not lose every game. Maybe you won one game. You did not lose every game, so you should be happy about this. So this is an imperative sentence. No subject, and the verb is in the original form. That's it. Uh, you cannot You can, you can do uh, make this into a passive sentence. Let's see. How should I do this? Uh, it would probably look something like B plus uh, past participle and something else. I can't think of a sentence. Oh, okay, okay. I, I have a, I have a sentence. So 
So in this sentence, the situation is your friends have thrown a surprise party for you, but you don't look surprised. So someone, maybe your boyfriend or girlfriend, pulls you aside and tells you, be surprised for your friends who threw this party. Even if you don't feel surprised, act surprised, be surprised. Uh, in this case, surprised is in the past participle. It is passive. You must look like you have been surprised. OK, so that's the imperative mood. Do you have questions? All right, let's do some practice. Please go to page 20. Gerunds and infinitives. Let's see, there are 16 questions. I will give you 10 minutes. All of these mistakes are related to gerunds and infinitives.
if you need more time, please raise your hand. I shall sit in Jinju Zhou. OK, so let's uh, start early. Question one. I don't enjoy watching TV. The difference between the two, right? Gerunds are a description of an action. Infinitives have to do with uncertainty and expectation. In this case, you only need the simple action. So enjoy watching. Number two, I prefer spending time playing board games and computer games, but actually the first one can be either. Usually uh, it is prefer A to B, which means you like A more than B. In this case, there is only one thing, playing board games and computer games. So you can put this thing before the two or after the two. So you can prefer spending or you can prefer to spend. Either one is fine. Three, it's important to keep your mind active. Right, so this is the example that I could not think of when I was telling you about the infinitive. It, okay, so this sentence, it's important to keep your mind active is actually uh, it has switched around. The original sentence looks like this. So the actual subject of this sentence is this action to keep your mind active. The verb is and important finishes the sentence. Sometimes in English, if the subject is too long, we will put it in the back of the sentence and in the front use the word it to remind people that this is not actually the subject. The real subject is coming at the back of the sentence. Number four. All uh, right, so in, in, in grammar, we call this a no subject. Number four, there's some evidence that older people can avoid becoming senile. Senile is an older word that means forgetful like an old person. By exercising their brain. Right, become is a verb, but after avoid, you need a noun as its object. So you turn this verb into a gerund because a gerund is a verb that acts like an, uh, a noun. Same here, by, after takes a noun, turn exercise into a noun. Exercise itself is also a noun, but when you use the word exercise as a noun, it does not mean the action of exercising. It means what you do when you exercise. Uh, but here you need the act of exercising, so you still should use a gerund. Five, playing word games is one way, one good way to stimulate your brain. Right, the subject playing word games, so you don't need it. You already have a subject. Six. In addition, it is beneficial for everyone to exercise regularly. Right, again, you can move this to the front if you want to. To exercise regularly is beneficial for everyone. Number seven, doctors advise older people to eat fish two or three times a week. This is advice. It is not describing an action. Will older people who receive this advice, follow the advice? We don't know. We expect them to, but it's not sure. So you use the infinitive. Eight, everyone should try to eat 
well and exercise every day. Same reason, you should try. Will you do it? We don't know, but we expect you to. Nine, Pedro is interested in learning about other cultures. OK, here's a grammar thing. You can say interested to learn something. And this something might be. An entire sentence. But if you use about. You must use in learning. Uh, because interested in the word in always takes a noun. Every preposition takes a noun except for two. Two sometimes takes a verb. So after in, you must have a noun. Ten. He wants to live in Japan next year. Same reason. Eleven. He is excited about attending a university there. Twelve. Right now, he is struggling to learn Japanese, right? Excited about attending in the future this entire thing. But here, struggling to do something, uh, not succeeding, trying, uncertainty. 13, he has a hard time pronouncing the words. 14, he keeps on studying. That's not how you spell studying. Studying and practicing. Also not how you spell this word. Studying and practicing. 15, at night he lies in bed listening to Japanese language teaching programs. If you use the word to here, it means in order to, Weila. Pretty sure that's not why he's lying in bed. Pretty sure he's lying in bed to sleep. 16, then he dreams of traveling to Japan. So not to travel, of traveling. And if you are British, you will spell traveling with two L's. Questions? OK, so I do have to point out something, which is. A lot of these questions. You might think, wait, the answer doesn't seem to fit your explanation, teacher. What's going on? And the simple truth is that. The distance between a gerund and an infinitive is very small. There are many situations where it looks like you should use one, but the correct answer is actually to use the other. And to this, I can only say uh, two things. One, often, whether to use the infinitive depends on the verb. Struggle to, wants to. It goes with the verb. Secondly, you know, we say that grammar has a logic, but really at the end of the day, it's whatever native speakers think is correct. Again, that's why English has so many exceptions. So if one answer doesn't seem to make sense, all I can say is native speakers do it this way. Sorry. Um, so really the key to improving grammar, especially in these detailed parts, is to read more, pay attention to the grammar when you read, and practice. And if you have questions, you can always ask me. OK, let's look at what the homework is. Please do up to page. Twenty five to the end of page twenty five. And next week we will have a presentation from group four. Group four, where are you? Are you ready? 
you will be ready by next week. OK, great. See you guys next week.